it's always hard when you serve a church for a long time. And my last two appointments were very long. One was 12 years, one was 11 years. When you get to know people that well and then you have to do their funeral, it's a tough thing to do. I did a funeral for a man named Austin Cummings, who was, I said at his funeral when I preached it, I said, you all remember the old Reader's Digest, they had a category called My Most Unforgettable Characters. Austin would be on mine because he was a character indeed. Every time he spoke, his wife would just hold her breath. She did not know what was going to come out of his mouth. Like the day that we announced that we were getting married. My husband, during the Joyce and Concerns, raised his hand and said, I asked y'all's pastor to marry me. She said yes, to which I said, is that a joy or a concern? But after the service, Austin greeted me at the door, and he said, congratulations on getting married, but we'd all just gotten used to the fact that you were a lesbian. <laughs> to which his wife just said, please forgive everything that comes out of his mouth. I said, nope, sorry, to disappoint you. He said, well, you were a lesbian and you converted, right? I said, it's not like being a Jew, Austin. No, I've always liked men. Then he said, I would have been keeping a closer eye on you. He also, God bless him, um, was on SPRC when I became appointed as pastor. As the first woman pastor, they were not excited to get a woman pastor, especially a lesbian woman pastor in there. Not that you all talk about your pastors and all that kind of stuff, right? No. But um, he was on the SPRC. Superintendent had introduced me, and they all sat there with their arms folded looking at me. And finally, she said, does anyone have any questions? Austin said, I have one. His wife was not in the room, so I didn't know yet what to expect, because usually she would just sit there and literally pray to God for whatever came out of his mouth, kind of like Sharon and Pete, you know, sort of. Just, just kidding, Pete, just kidding. But um, he said, I have one question for you. What are you going to do if you come in some Sunday morning and there's a stick of dynamite on the pulpit? I found out later he was a retired explosives engineer from DuPont. What I said to him was, well, that's better than putting it in the candle holder and saying, here, Lev, Rev, light it up. I said, I'm going to think you're not too subtle when I found out what he did for a living. But I said, this is great because I've always wanted a pyrotechnician on the worship committee. Can you imagine Pentecost with real flames? He was not amused by that one either. But thinking about pyrotechnics, which is the fireworks sort of thing, do we have any physicists here? Did anybody study physics in college? Because if you did, I'm in trouble up here this morning. Because what was the title of my sermon? Thermodynamics. Anybody familiar with thermodynamics? I t the only science course, I had to take one science course, one math course in college. I took teaching arithmetic to preschoolers, also known as math for English majors. And I also took physics of light and color, which was known as science for English majors. But thermodynamics is the study of the transfer of energy. Now, did Barry get my slides up there? Is there another slide after this one? Nope. He didn't get it in. I sent him some pictures of what I looked on. There's a book called Thermodynamics for Dummies. I couldn't understand a thing in that one. Then there was one called Baby Loves Thermodynamics. That was a little bit too basic. It said, baby loves to sit in the sun because the sunlight makes baby warm. I'm a little bit advanced in that in my science. But this is what I found on a site called Science for Kids. In broad terms, thermodynamics deals with the transfer of energy from one place to another, from one form of to another. The key concept is that heat is a form of energy cor corresponding to a definite amount of mechanical work. Let me say that again. Thermodynamics deals with the transfer of energy from one place to another and from one form to another. Now when you're thinking about tongues of fire resting on people's heads and they're not getting burned, that's energy because heat is energy. I've often said that to be a trustee in a church you should have a basic knowledge of thermodynamics in that you want to heat a sanctuary and you turn the heat on, what's going to happen if you open the doors to the sanctuary? You all know that, right? It's going to go right on out the door because heat is attracted to cold. How many of you have ever yelled at somebody, close the refrigerator, you're letting the cold air out? You're really letting the warm air in because cold doesn't move into hot as much as hot moves into cold. I'm getting some nods out there like, I hope you know what you're talking about, Pastor. But there are laws to thermodynamics, and the first law states that when heat is added to a system, some of the energy stays in the system, some leaves the system. The energy that leaves does work on the area around it. Energy that stays in the system creates an increase in the internal energy of the system. I think the church is a system in some ways, don't you? When we operate as a system, we've got parts, we've got jobs, we've got things like that. Now, Let's go back to the story of Pentecost before we get more into the thermodynamics of church life. Because 
Shavuot is what Pentecost is for Jews. Because it said on the day of Pentecost, it was like, ooh, we, we put a new name on a Christian observance. Shavuot was the harvest festival of the spring. Orthodox Jews still celebrate Shavuot. Here's the question. If you came to the first service, you're not allowed to answer this one. But what story from scripture do Jews, Orthodox Jews read on Shavuot? Think harvest. The story of Ruth. The story of harvest goes back to the book of Deuteronomy when the law was given. And if you're going to have a harvest, what did you leave behind in your fields when you harvested your crops? You know what you left behind? You left behind some of what you were harvesting for the poor among you because they could go behind you and glean, which is what First Fruits Farms about in some ways when they're doing their harvest. But they, they give their entire harvest away. But there are places where you can go and do gleaning today, even the potato project of, some of you ever do the potato project, St. Stephen Ministries? You get to go out and harvest after the harvest has been collected, you get to go and pick up hundreds of pounds of food that otherwise would be left behind. It's called gleaning, and you leave that for the poor, which is punctuated by I am the Lord your God, which always gets my attention when something ends with I am the Lord your God. So Shavuot is why they were all gathered together in Jerusalem. They were at the temple. They were making their grain offerings. They were bringing so much to the temple. And what happened when they were all gathered together in that one place? The Holy Spirit came upon them, touched them on the heads with fire. That did not burn them. But if we think of fire as heat, because what are the three things you need? we got some fire people here. I know you'll get this one. What are the three things that fire needs to burn? Oxygen. Fuel and heat. Oxygen, fuel, and heat are needed to burn. So if we think of the Holy Spirit as energy and heat, then let's look at what these laws of physics say. It is impossible to have a process that transfers heat to cool objects, to warm objects, without using work. And here's one. If you were married, you know the answer to this one, right? A cold body cannot heat up a warm body. Think of sleeping in bed with somebody whose feet are warmer than yours. Anybody ever want to reach over and put your feet on the warm feet to warm up? Yes. Amen to that one. Heat naturally wants to flow from warmer to cooler areas. Heat wants to flow and spread out to areas with less heat. Okay, you're all sitting there going, what is she talking about? When is she going to make any sense? Hopefully soon. A thermodynamic system. This is the definition of the thermodynamic system. is one that interacts and exchanges energy with the area around it. The exchange and transfer need to happen in at least two ways. At least one must be the transfer of heat. The thermodynamic system is in equilibrium. It cannot change its state or status without interacting with its environment. Simply put, if you're in equilibrium, you're a happy system. Just minding your own business. You can't really do anything. If you do, you have to interact with the world around you. That's where this is the church. Because if the Holy Spirit touches us, we keep it in here, there's work to be done, and there's work that will be done inside. But if we don't spread outside, what's going to happen to the church? We're not going to be the church anymore. We're going to be a country club. We're going to be irrelevant in the world because we will exist to entertain each other and amuse each other here. We will exist to listen to each other sing the beautiful hymns we sing on Sunday morning. We will exist to say hello to people we know and love every Sunday. But God help us if we go outside these doors. The fire of Pentecost touched the heads of people. What were they able to do that they had not been able to do before? You heard the story. You know the story. What were they able to do? They heard the word being spoken in their own language by these simple fishermen and tax collectors, this ragtag bunch of people who followed this guy Jesus around. Suddenly they are able to proclaim God's word in the languages of the world. and People are amazed. What does that tell you about God's word and God's church? Is it open to just the people who look like us and talk like us and act like us? No, it's meant for the entire world. But if we keep it inside, what's going to happen to it? It's just like the fire. It's going to go out because there will be no more oxygen. We will have used it all up ourselves. Now, think about what Jesus said before he left in John's gospel. They said, show us the Father. I'm sure he rolled his eyes like, have you been with me all this time and you still don't get who I am, do you? 
because if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And if you don't believe that, just believe the works you've seen. Here's your Bible quiz of the morning. What are the works they have seen Jesus do in John's Gospel? I want to make you do all four. John's Gospel. First sign in John's Gospel was what? Wedding at Cana of Galilee, what did he do? Water into wine. Water into wine. What else did he do in John's Gospel? What did he do with Lazarus in John's Gospel? Only Gospel where that appears, that story. He was dead, and what did he do? Called him out of his tomb, and he regained his life and went forward, and they said, unwrap him and set him free. That's what Jesus said. What else did Jesus do in God, John's Gospel? He fed the multitudes with very little food because what was there was offered to God and God blessed it and Jesus broke it and Jesus shared it. In John's Gospel, Jesus is the one alone who feeds all of those people. They sit down and he feeds the thousands who have gathered there on that hillside. What else does he do in John's Gospel? He causes a blind man to see. He does everything that we've seen him do. And what does he say in John's Gospel? If you see the works that I've done and you believe in them, you will do greater works than these because what's going to happen? I'm going to leave, but the advocate is going to come alongside you. That's literally what the word paraclete means, that word that's translated as Holy Spirit. When the Spirit comes alongside you, think about coming alongside you. Who's come alongside you in your life? If you ever taught a kid to ride a bicycle, you know what it is to run while holding on to a bicycle, right? How many of you learned to ride a bike by somebody riding, running alongside you, holding the bike up until you got your balance and you found it. How many of you did that then for your own child at some point in your life? That's what the Holy Spirit is, the one who comes alongside us, the advocate. Advocate in a legal sense. If you have to go to court, you need an advocate, don't you? We have some CPE, CPAs in the congregation. I asked Jerry today, I said, if one of your clients is audited, you get to go for them, don't you? Yes, you do. You get to be their advocate. We have an advocate in the Holy Spirit. We are told we'll be able to do what Jesus does and more, but not if we stay inside this building. If we stay inside this building, we might as well just shut the doors and windows for good, not to keep in the heat, but because we will no longer be a congregation in the name of Jesus Christ. We've got to share the love of God in the world. So how are we going to do that? We read some ways today, Vacation Bible School. I cannot tell you the number of times when I have done premarital counseling for couples that are not related to the congregations I've served, which is most of the couples. You, know, you don't have a lot of people who get married in your congregation usually. Why? Because one thing, the United Methodist Church is not really great at keeping young people in the church. So by the time they're of marrying age, they're somewhere else or no place at all, basically, which speaks a lot to our inability to share the gospel in a very real and compelling way. But um, can I get you to not do that? Thank you. Okay, I get a little distracted up here sometimes, sorry. But if we're going to be authentic in the church, in the world, we've got to be able to share with everyone of every age. Brides and grooms come to me and I'll say to them, do you have any experience at all with the church? And you know what they say if they have any experience at all. It's because, like I said before, a neighbor brought them to vacation Bible school when they were a child. That is the only exposure most people have to Jesus Christ. When I leave here in the afternoon, if I hit it at the right time or the wrong time is the case, maybe I get the bus that's coming down Abbey Road dropping off kids all the way down these Warren Road, children who would be Bible school age for us, but no one invites them to come to church. People don't come to church because of the pastor. I hate to tell you that. They come because someone thought enough of them to invite them to church. When's the last time you invited someone to church? I'm going to ask you that right now. When's the last time you invited someone to come to church? And if you didn't, why didn't you do it? You're afraid you bore them or you're afraid you'll be offensive to them? Now, don't invite your Presbyterian neighbors to say, my church is better than your church, or your neighbors who go to Grace Fellowship or Hunt Valley Church. They're happy there. Let them be there. But if you don't invite people, no one's ever going to come. And if you don't speak about Jesus Christ to someone, no one's going to learn about him from you or from anyone in this congregation. Not the best sermon I've ever preached. I get that. I'm a little distracted this morning because I found out my cross that I've worn around my neck for over 30 years is gone. And I'm pretty sure I know where it is. I think it's in the Cockeysville landfill. Because um, someone was at my house, and my computer got knocked on the floor. Um, it was an overnight guest, and he was helping me flip the mattress. My surrogate son, Sam, and my computer went flying, and the mouse went flying. I was in the middle of 
emptying the trash, and I realized later that both my computer mouse and my cross were on the table. They're gone now. That cross was my way of meeting a lot of people in Jesus Christ, because people would say, what a beautiful cross. Is that a crucifix? And I'd say, no, it's the Good Shepherd. And people literally would stop and look at it and say, that is so beautiful. And they would then say something to me about their faith, or I need to get back to church, and I'd say, I know where you can go. They'd say, is the pastor good where you go? And I'd say, eh, not always, but she tries. And there were times in my life when I would be upset, and I would just hold on to my cross. But right now, i got to get a new one, because that one's not going to come back to me. And I'm a little distracted, because I spent the last half hour at my house searching diligently for my cross that I couldn't find, instead of going over my sermon, which I usually do. I know this is weird to talk about thermodynamics, but heat and energy are what we need in the church. We need some energy. We need the spark of God to light you up and send you into the world all fired up for Jesus, right? And there's stuff in Scripture about being lukewarm as well, and that's not what we want to be. So we need to feed the flames of the Spirit within our own hearts so that we can go into the world and share God's love in powerful ways. This congregation ministers to the community in powerful ways. One of the ways is through the Thrifty Penny. I said that last week. About the man who came here looking for clothes of all different sizes, they found out what he needed. He was buying clothes for homeless people in Baltimore City. So they stopped charging him. They just give him clothes when they come in now. I want you to think for a moment, where are the cold places that need the warmth of your love in this area? There are places around the world. The Ukraine needs the warmth of God's love. Vladimir Putin's heart needs the warmth of God's love. He is a professing Christian. I'm telling you, the head of the Orthodox Church in Russia needs the warmth of God's love to spark him to stand up to this man who is destroying life in the name of Jesus Christ and say, enough is enough. So where are the cold places around you? Where are the places that cry out for warmth? Now, it's going to get really hot soon, and there are going to be places crying out for cool weather. But we have people in this neighborhood, this neighborhood, who cannot afford to heat their homes in the winter. That's a physical need for heat. There are people in this neighborhood who have lost hope, who are brokenhearted, who think there is nothing good for them. There are people in this neighborhood who are addicted. There are people in this neighborhood who are lost and longing for what we have in abundance. Don't let them stay in the cold. Let the warmth of this congregation that is energized through the Holy Spirit flow through us into the world. That's what Pentecost is about. It's not about giving ourselves a party, although the kids got two cupcakes today, and I said, please forgive me for sugaring up your children and sending them home to you. But take that enthusiasm and take it into the world. In Christ's holy name, amen. I'm going to ask you to sing with me, and then we're going to have some real fun because we're going to share communion, but first we're going to bring some people into membership this morning. Please stand and join in singing.